Okay, so there was some confusion about how these different parts work together, and so that's why I, I kind of drew this diagram. So here's at the top. At the top, we have the RH career path, which we're going to look at in a minute. At a minute, we're, everybody should have a job description. Everybody does not currently have a job description, but I'm working on it. Okay, so everybody should have a job description. There's going to be a set of specializations, which we'll talk about. Okay, those three things, the goal of the, those three things is to set expectations. That is the principal's way of communicating to the team. If you want to fill this certain role at our company, this is what we expect. This is the value that you have to pro provide to justify that compensation package. Okay, and we're going to look at an example here in a minute. Okay, then, so that's the first part. That's setting expectations. That alone, ladies and gentlemen, is something that I did not have at any place I worked before RH. I can't remember having a surveyor job where somebody handed me a list of what it was I was supposed to do. Okay? And I, and I had some other jobs where that goalpost got changed every 90 days. Right? They tell me, this is your job. As soon as I started meeting that job, what do you think they did? Yeah. They'd be like, oh, well, that, that is your job, but now you got to do this too. And it was a super frustrating experience for me, right? Because I felt like I could never be successful. Okay, so set, setting those expectations is really important. Now, there's other, that's not the only reason we have job descriptions. You know, the other thing, the other reason we, we do that is because it helps with, the, with like accountability, right? Is this your job or not? If you don't know that it's your job, I can't hold you accountable for it, right? So it's not just compensation. There's other reasons why. Um, it, it also helps us with recruiting. So job descriptions are something we try and provide people when we hire them. Why is that important, do you think? If I'm going to go hire somebody that I give them a job description. None of you all got that benefit, but we're trying to, we're trying to do that. Why is that important? So they know what kind of job they're actually getting. Yeah, I don't want them to get here and say, hey, this isn't the job I signed up for. Everybody loses in that situation. I'm just curious, did you get a job description? Well, that's it's funny you, you say that because in my offer of employment letter, uh, you, you outline some basic tasks that I would be expected yeah. to perform. And you also briefly laid out um, two criteria for future right. added compensation. Yep. And I should say, this maybe is an assumption, but one of the reasons why we're talking about this is because there was some confusion uh, on my part when I sat down with Danny and Brian earlier this week. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. We're get, so we're getting better. So Nick did, Nick did get some idea what he was signing up for in his offer letter. Okay, it probably wasn't as detailed as what we're going to look at today. Um, so that's something that we're working on. We're, so we're trying to get better. Um, so some of y'all are just stuck now because you already took the job, right? But new people should get a good idea of what they're getting themselves into. That's the goal. Um, and just to be clear too, since Nick mentioned it, here's how, here's how it usually works when we make somebody an employment offer. Usually, they come in on, on a kind of a probationary period and it's usually about six months. Okay, so I usually what I usually tell people is they're going to start at a, at a certain wage at the beginning. Then with then we usually say if you meet A B C criteria, then we'll give you a bump at the six months. That all happens outside of the program that we're talking about here. And the reason we do that is I'm trying to avoid a situation here where I get somebody that's a great salesman that makes me all kinds of promises, and then when I get them in here at the job, what happens? If you don't deliver. Right, so that's that's part of how we're trying to share some of that risk with the employee. Okay, all right. So <clears throat> this next part, so that's setting expectations. This next thing is my, this is my part. Okay, this is this is my part. It's Dan. When I say my part, it's Danny's part and Brian's part of my part. So this is this is what we do, Danny and Brian and I. It's a big part of what we do to try and make sure you guys get paid fairly. Okay, and that is monthly look-aheads and what I call the annual skill review. Now again, there's other reasons we do monthly look-aheads. Okay, one of the reasons we do monthly look-aheads that is totally unrelated to compensation is 
to give you guys an opportunity at least once a month to bring concerns or questions or what, you know, that's your one-on-one -on -one time with a principal to talk about what you need or anything that you might be having a problem with, right? Okay, so that's just, that's completely unrelated to your growth as a professional and what we pay you, okay? But a very important part of the MLA that is related to compensation is that little section that says, what did I learn or accomplish last month? And you guys usually have one or two or three things on there, and then the principal usually has a couple things that he's put on there, right? Okay, and like we don't just talk about that and then round file it, okay? So what happens is we save all your guys' MLAs, every one, okay? And then what happens at your annual skill review, and I think the only one we've done this with is Elena, is that your annual skill review, which should happen once a year, so just to be clear, I hate annual reviews. Okay, your annual skill review is not about the kind of job you did last year. It has nothing to do with that. It's all about what did you learn the last year, and does that or does that not justify an increase in your money in your compensation? That's the whole. That's what the whole conversation is about. Okay, so what what Monique does before the annual review is she goes through your MLA and she compiles that list of everything that you learned. You said you learned or accomplished for. Each of those 12, hopefully 12 MLAs for the year. Okay, so that could be somewhere between, I don't know, 12 to 36 things that you've accomplished, right? And then and then I usually look at the list. If you're my employee, I'll look at that list. There may be some things that aren't on the list that we will add to the list. Okay, and then we got to sit down and say, all right, given what's on this list, has the employee earned an increase in compensation in the last 12 months. Okay. Now for almost all of you, almost all the people that work for me, what is likely the answer to that question on an annual basis? Definitely a hell no. No, it's actually yeah, no. <laughs> it's almost always for most of you going to be yes, because do I have an, an old and experienced team or a young and inexperienced team? Young and inexperienced. So that means chances are over the last year, what has happened to each one of you? Learned something. You've learned something, right? And so that's just going to be the typical process. You know, until you get to be a crusty guy, old fart like Brian, probably as a general rule, when we do your annual skill review, you've earned some money, almost without a doubt, right? <clears throat> so there's there will be some exceptions to that. You know, basically Brian and Danny and I are tapped out, right? So I'm not, Danny's probably not giving me a raise ever again. Okay, and then, you know, we may have a couple of the gals I mentioned, a Monique and Elaine, that may, may potentially be tapped out, depending on how aggressive they want to get. Okay, but most of the rest of you folks are going to be getting, you're going to be earning money every year when we do your annual skill review. Okay, so the whole point of that is to avoid the trap that owners fall into of failing to recognize the, the growth in our employees, because that happens all the time. I'll give you an example. Um, I went to Elena's wedding, and uh, there was a kind of a friend of a family friend that came with her daughter. And the last time I saw that little girl, she was that tall. Okay, and she showed up at Elena's reception in a pair of heels, and she was taller than me. And I about fell out my chair. I couldn't believe it was her. I seen her with her mom, and I didn't know. I had to ask her mom, "Is that your daughter?" Because I didn't, I didn't even recognize her. Okay, so but. The, what that illustrates is if you're if you're with somebody every day, what what can what can happen? What's the pitfall? They grow See the room, not realize it. Yeah, like every once in a while, my my wife will put up a picture of of the two of us when we got married, and like I have to do I do a double take sometimes because I don't recognize Monique, right? Because she was like 28, had long dark hair, and was a lot thinner than she is now, right? But like I don't think about that now because her change, like now she's sh got short blonde curly hair, right? And she's got some wrinkles, you know, we've gotten old together. But do I notice that on a daily basis? Because those changes have been gradual, right? Every day. Okay, so that'll happen to me as an employee, right? Austin, I, you know, if I'm not careful, Austin will be a great surveyor in three years from now. And I'll still be treating him like he just came out of architecture school. Right, so that's this whole that's the whole point of this part right here. This is my I don't I don't know if I want to call it I know it's obligation is the wrong word. This is my commitment to you guys that we're trying to track your actual progress. Okay. Okay, here's your part. 
So these two are required. We're going to do this whether you like it or not. Okay, no matter what. Okay, but this is this is your part down here. This is optional. Okay, and that is the professional development plan and the PDH program. Okay, so you might they'll, they'll sound like the same. This should this should be a professional development program. Okay, so they're not the same. So let me explain how this should work. You should be able to get your current job description. Okay, and what you want to look at is you want to look at your current job description and you want to ask this question. What areas am I weak in based on my current job description? Okay. Okay, and then you might even want to look at your next the next job description up in the career path. And you might want to say, all right, what do I got to work on to get to the next if I want to jump up to the next job description, and we're going to look at the career path in a minute, and I'll explain all this, okay? So you want to look at areas that you're weak in, and each of you has different weaknesses, right? It's like, I mean, it's not a secret. Like, what's my what's my buddy Angelo weak in? Computers. Math, maybe a little bit of computers, probably not his strong suit, right? Okay, but he has a he has a, a strength that is the opposite of Elena, so Elena has a weakness. What is Elena's weakness? She cares too much. No, 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 no. <laughs> what is Angelo, what strength does Angelo have that Elena does not just by the very nature of their jobs? It's good in the field. field yeah, Elena, Elena is weak in her knowledge of what we do in outside, right? That's just by nature of her job. That's just the, you know, same thing with Austin, right? Okay, so what you gotta do is sit down and look at your plan and say, all right, where, am I, where might I be weak? Because here's what we're trying to do to a certain level in the career path, we are trying to develop well-rounded surveyors. Okay, so everybody that works for me in the technical field has to know some CAT. You cannot work here and not know CAT. Okay. Why do I make Angelo draft swing tie corner records? Anybody can do field work. And I know he hates it. But if you're going to work here, what you got to be able to do? Yeah. You got to know CAD. You got to know some CAD, no matter what, right? Okay, in a similar vein, should Elena be able to walk into a garage sale and identify a total station? Yeah. Yes, she should know what that tool looks like and she should know what it does, right? One could argue she should probably be able to set one up and level it, okay? And we may not be there yet, but that's the goal. Same thing with Austin, right? Okay. So you look at your current job description and you identify, hey, where are some areas that I need to work on to be a well-rounded surveyor at this point in my career, okay? And then that, that is more than, you are more than welcome to have that conversation with your principal, okay? And then what you do is you come up with a plan. That's the top part. It might be one page. Maybe it's a page and a half. You come up with a plan with your principal. How am I going to address these areas that I need to improve in, right? Over the next six months or 12 months, whatever period time period you feel is appropriate. Okay, now some of that's gonna be on you and some of that's gonna be on me. So for example, how's Elena gonna get field experience? It's gotta demand it. But that, I, we have to facilitate that for her. Some of it, right? I do not expect Elena to go get her own field experience. That's not very practical, is it? Right? What's this What's this right here? What's number three? Attainable. Attainable. Did I expect Angelo to buy AutoCAD and put it on his home computer and work on CAD on weekends? No. Yeah, that's, you know, I got to be reasonable, grounded in reality and attainable. Right? So a big part of addressing your guys' weaknesses is going to be working with your principal to facilitate the growth that you need here. Now, we got to be balanced in that, because if I always have people doing what they're not good at, how profitable are we going to be? Yeah. So there's a trade-off there, right? Like, sometimes I just need Elena to draft a topo. Why? Because she's really good at it. Really like, when Elena drafts topo, we make money. Okay? Um, when Angelo drafts topo, you know, we're probably, I'm probably not making money. Okay? So there's a balance there, but does that mean that the only thing Elena ever does is draft topo? That's not going to help her. In any other company, yes. Okay, yes, yes. but that's not going to help her. Like, I occasionally need to expose her to some other stuff, right? And I'm not just picking on Elena. Let's, let's take Austin for a minute. Uh, do I make money when Austin drafts records of survey? Yes. 
Yes, I do. He's pretty good at it, right? I mean, he's been doing it for a year. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's good. I like it when Austin drafts records a survey because when he does that, I make money. Okay, but Austin's been bugging me for six months. I need more field time. Say, now, do I make a ton of money when Austin's in the field? I feel like you would. I feel like... Well, field's a little bit easier, yeah, but why, why you gotta, why you gotta mess up my teaching? <laughs> my point is, my point is, it would, RH has an obligation to help you address your weak spots through on-the-job training, and we understand that. There's a balance. I also need to be profitable. I can't have you here every day working at what you're not good at. Okay, but you know, occasionally we will make time for you to do new stuff. That's important, right? And then I think about somebody that hire like Michaela, right? Like, what's Michaela good at when she starts? I go, I, yeah, everything she does is where. Well, she has a good work ethic. And she's a smart girl, but I'm just saying, like, you know, Angelo. When Angelo started, what was he good at? Nothing. Yeah, he wasn't good enough. He didn't know which end of a survey rod went up, pointed up, right? Okay, so. That's your part. So the first thing to do is sit down and get a plan. Okay, that should be something you talk to you <laughs> to your principal about. One of the reasons we gave you each a principal is because does Landon have time to do this for fourteen people? Nope. Okay, so we split it up. I heard Brian. He was. I was laughing at Brian the other day because he's like, I swear to God, I just did Cameron's MLA a week ago. I was like, How do you think I felt when I was doing twelve of them? Every time I turned around, I was doing an MLA, right? Okay, so raise your hand if you have a professional development plan that you've talked about with your principal. Okay, Nick says kind of, sort of. Elena's hand was about a third of the way up. Okay, so that is something that we need to work on as a company, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, today. Okay, so I'll tell you, I think Elena is the closest. Because she, her and I had that conversation, and she gave me a list of stuff that she thought she needed to learn, and I still have it. She probably thinks I lost it, but I don't. I still have it. Now, I'm no longer Elena's principal, so I need to get that list to Danny. He's asked for it. And we're going to get that list over to Danny so that we can we can work on some of Elena. So Elena's probably the closest. Austin has asked. He's been asking for the last two months, and I, we just, I haven't done it yet. Okay? So some of this failure is our failure. Okay, but you guys, what do you got to, what do you got to, if you need something from a principal to make this work and you're, and you're not getting it, you got to keep asking until we get it done, right? Come and tell me every Monday and Wednesday until it's done, right? Because at some point I will get tired of hearing you and what will I do? Sit down, do, it, do it. I will sit down and do it. Okay, so Elaine is probably the closest, but everybody needs a, a professional development plan, which means everybody needs the job description. And my wife has been on my case about that. So I took two days this week and worked on job descriptions. Okay? And, I, and I'm not done. I'll do some more. Okay? All right. So then once you have your, your plan, then you can start knocking stuff off your list. Okay? And we're going to talk a little bit about how that works. So let's look at... We're just going to go through this from top to bottom. So let's look at the. Any questions so far? Hunter, Mr. Uh, not Stetson. necessarily related to the professional development plan, but when I got hired, you gave me like a menu of. Uh, that's what you called it. Was the menu of pay raise options, and it was like get LSIT five dollars. Yeah, no, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna talk we're gonna talk about that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, can somebody borrow me the career path real quick? Let me just look at this for a second. Okay, so here's the career path. Okay, so right now we have this career path covers 80% of the of the of the technical people. Okay, so now we got we have some special people. We know that, right? We know we have special people working for us, right? Okay, so there's some special people that aren't on this list. Okay, so Bree is not on here. She wants to be an environmental. She wants to work in, in environmental uh, regulation and planning, so she's not on this list. And who's oh, and Aaliyah is not on this list. Aaliyah wants to do business and content marketing, so they're not included in this. We we will eventually have a career path that covers everybody, okay? But this covers eighty percent of my folks, right here, okay? So let me just walk you through this. I'm sorry, Austin, that I stole your career plan. Okay, so at the top we have the survey apprentice cad tech. 
Okay, so there's some important information in, in each of these little boxes. Okay, so the first one, you see the circle that says one to two? Mm -hmm. That's how many years of experience that person typically has in that role. Now, you could be exceptionally gifted and be ahead of that, or, you know, you might take a little longer to bake in the oven, and you might be a little bit behind that. That's okay, but that gives you a rough idea, right? So if I hire somebody with seven to nine years of experience, where are they probably dropping in at? Okay, so that just gives you a rough idea, right? That sounds about right. Okay, so look, I hired Brian. Brian, how long have you been surveying? Uh, 14 years, 15 years. Okay, so where'd Brian drop in at? Principal survey. That's right, well, yeah. Danny, how long have you been surveying? About the same. Yeah, so. Yeah, so look, if I go hire a licensed surveyor with, with 13 years of experience, he's probably going to be a what? That's a good chance. Right? It's a good chance. So this, this kind of works. This diagram works. Okay? So that's what's in the circle. Now, if you look over in the blue box, that's the typical pay range. Okay? And it's, it's basically, once you get past the first step, they're basically $10 bands. Okay? Now, there's, there's room for a little variation in the band there, right, which we'll explain in a minute, okay, but if I've hired you and, you're, and you know your billing rate is a senior land planner, do you know how much money you should be making within 10 bucks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you do. Um, if you're, if I go hire, so we might, well, there's a possibility we may get a new drafter here at the end of the year, she's brand new, okay, if I start her out, do we know about what she's going to be making? Okay, so here, this gets back to the transparent and fair part. If you know what somebody's job description is here, do you have a rough idea of what they're making within five to ten bucks? Yeah. Yeah. Listen, when I, when I was at my first job, the one I was at for 12 years, it, it, what everybody got paid was a huge secret. And you know why? It, they kept it a huge secret? Because they don't want you talking about it. Brian, why'd they keep it a huge secret? Because they had favorites. Yeah, so I know for a fact that they had engineers there that got hired out of college that made more than I did after five or six years at the company. Okay, but they, did they want me to know that? Okay, so we don't have that problem here. You guys know, okay? And we're gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna you're gonna know, you're gonna know actually better than that ten dollar band. You're gonna know within two or three bucks. Okay, and I'll explain that in a minute. Okay, then you see with a little black box with this number in it, the one number. Okay, that's the number of specializations. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Okay, so everybody should be able to look at this and get a rough idea of what they should be making, right? And like, I, you guys know how I roll. I, I don't, I don't have any secrets. So right now, I'm paying myself fifty dollars an hour. Okay. Now, by the time you add in health insurance for me and Monique, we're solidly, I'm probably making fifty-eight. So, am I overpaying myself according to this chart? No, right where I should be. Okay. All right, now you'll notice when you get past map or GIS analyst, the path splits. Okay, so what that basically means is, I told you guys we were going to talk about this, until you're a map or GIS analyst, what we call a junior map or GIS analyst, everybody on those first two rungs has to acquire the same basic body of knowledge. Right? because I'm trying to make well-rounded surveyors. So you guys know what that is, right? You gotta know some CAD, you gotta know some basic math, you gotta know a little bit about field surveying, right? You gotta know a little bit about GIS. Okay, once you get past that step, we're gonna allow you to specialize a little bit, okay? So the middle rung is for people that wanna get licensed, be licensed surveyors. So that's probably Nick and Hunter, okay? The rung on, I can't tell, is it the left side? No, right side, where it says assistant land planner. Okay, that might be somebody like Bree. Okay, or, or we don't really have a land planner yet, but that's somebody that's gonna help me with all the planning stuff. General plan, specific plan, zoning, LAFCO, tentative map applications, okay. Then the right side, I think, is somebody that, that might be like Elena. Okay, so maybe Elena doesn't want to be a licensed surveyor, but she likes doing CAD stuff. So that's kind of the CAD GIS track, right? Okay, so those are the three paths. So 
once you get past the first two steps, you know, I don't expect, so for example, if I had a senior land planner in here, does she need to be a, an expert on title insurance and boundary resolution? No. No, that, I just, she's gonna have to know a little bit about that because she's gotta know enough to get past this second rung. But after that, we're gonna let her specialize, okay? So I don't expect everybody to be a licensed surveyor here. You can make money here. You know, we, we do a lot more than just survey here, right? We do a lot of other related stuff, okay? All right, so let's look at any questions on the career path. Okay, so let me explain briefly two, two things before we go to the next step. I got a question. Yes. So what's this horizontal gray line between senior and principal? Okay, so, okay, what you, okay, so that is the line you do not want to cross. <laughs> okay, so now it's a good question, so let me talk about it for a minute. It's the line when you stop getting paid. Okay, yeah, so here's how we purposely set the company up this way. If you want to make the maximum amount of money possible, you stay right above that line. Because once you cross that line, two or three really important things happen. Okay, I'm glad you brought it up, Hunter, because it's a great question. Okay, so here's the two or three, two or three things that's, that don't happen. Number one is you are no longer guaranteed a paycheck. So you cross that blue line, you're no longer guaranteed a paycheck. So who's the last guy to get paid? I'm the last guy to get paid, right? Because I'm a majority, majority shareholder. Now, here's the good thing about that. Who has the incentives to make really smart decisions about how we spend money? I do. Because I'm, I'm the first guy to feel the pain, right? But my partners are feeling some pain right now with us, okay? So that's one thing that happens when you cross the blue line. It's actually blue. I know it's printed gray, but it's kind of a bluish line. Okay, here's the other thing that happens when you cross the blue line. You cross the blue line, you no longer get 10% commission. Well, once you're, guess what? What's part of being a principal? Oh, yeah, profit sharing. Going, getting work. Getting work. Like, you want to cross that blue line, you'll be able to go get some work. And, and we're like, I don't pay you for that privilege once you're a principal. And okay, now let's just say Elena, you know, she just married into a family of vast wealth and they need help managing all their real estate holdings in California. And she brings that work. She gets 10% of it forever. Well, until she becomes a principal. Okay, but if she never becomes a principal, if she stays right above that line, I'll pay that 10% forever. Okay, so we pay Rick 10% of the work that we got from his utility client, and I will pay that 10% to him until he dies, because that's, that's how it works. Okay, now, what do I hope that incentive does? Get some, to get us more work. Not just him, who else? Anybody. You guys, right? Yeah, that's a pretty powerful incentive. Brian, you ever had that kind of opportunity anywhere you worked, that 10% commission? The reason I never had that opportunity is one of the main reasons I'm here and not with my previous employer. <laughs> so Brian was bringing in a ton of work to his last employer, and when he said, hey, what's the chances I could get a little piece of that profit, they told him, yeah, that's cute, pound sand. The right. irony is he's a principal here, so he wouldn't get that commission yeah, so anymore. Now he's anyway. principal in it. So here's how the principals get that. The, the, the principals are primarily going to get that through the profit share. Okay. But uh, if you bring work into the company, I don't, I don't want... If you're an employee, you don't, you don't really have control on whether or not the work from a new client is profitable. Who has that control? The principals do. We're the ones that price the work and manage the contract. So... If you're an employee, all you got to do is bring me the work. It's my job to make sure it's profitable. You're going to get your 10% no matter what. That's why I don't give you a percentage of the profit on a new client. I give you a percentage of gross revenue on a new client. Okay, because it's not your job. If Austin brings me a new client, it's not Austin's job to make sure we make money on that client. It's my job. Austin gets his cut. When you bring in a new client, you get your cut before we take our, before we know whether we're profitable or not. It's a, it's a gross revenue cut. Does that make sense? And now the only thing I ask on the 10% is you guys don't get your 10% till we get our bill paid. So if your new client stiffs me on my bill, I'm not gonna pay you, okay? So you wanna make sure you bring me good clients, okay? But you don't have to worry about whether or not they make money. We make money working for them, that's my job. Okay, now once you're a principal, part of the reason you don't get your 10% as a principal is because what kind of clients do I want my principals to bring me? Profitable. Clients, are all clients profitable? No, we've sure learned that the hard way the last nine months, haven't we? 
right? Okay, yeah. So one of the reasons the principals get their compensation and profit share or not the 10% commission is because the principals do have control over whether or not work for a client is profitable. And like, guess what? It's, it's been, it's very difficult to do, but one of the things I have realized over the last couple of months is there is an unprofitable client that I need to stop working for, right? So I've done that, <clears throat> or we're in the process of doing that. Okay, so it's a good question. So one was, you're not guaranteed a paycheck. The other one is you lose your 10% commission. Now what that means is the flip side of that is you guys, if we ever one day do a profit share, you guys will see the principal's profit share is gonna, they're, they're, our shares in the profit pool will be significantly larger than the, than the employees. You know, we, we might have double. So if Elena's got three shares, I'm gonna have six probably. That's roughly what the numbers are gonna look like. Okay, because that's how we're rewarding, you know, the principals have to have some reward for skipping the paychecks and not getting the 10%, right? And again, that puts the incentives in the right spot. Who has the incentives to make sure that work for new clients is profitable? Yes. The principals. Who has the control to make sure that work for new new clients is profitable? Yes. The principals. We put the incentive where it belongs, right? Why is Landon Blake the last guy to get paid? Who has the final say on how things run around here? Yeah. Landon Blake does. So guess what? I'm the first guy that goes hungry when I've made a bad decision. Right? That gives me a very strong incentive to make good decisions. Right? It's not like other places you work where the owner screws something up and like the bottom 20% of the company gets whacked. Right? Like that's not how we roll here. <laughs> okay, so there was one other thing that happens when you go below the line. I'm trying to remember what it was. Um, it's the no commission. It's the, oh, the other thing that happens when you go below the line is you become salaried. Mm -hmm. Okay, which means you no longer make overtime. Now, we haven't done this yet because we've been broke, but what we are going to try to do, what we, what we will try to do is we do try and compensate principals at their straight time rate for every hour they work, especially if it's billable. Okay, but no overtime once you cross that line. Now, one thing that's very different from our company Remember I told you guys I built this company to specifically to not be the other places I've worked, right? Okay, so one thing we, that, is, that is very different about us is um, we do not have anybody working here salaried that isn't a shareholder. And we never will. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now here's what a lot of other companies do. As soon as you get licensed, they make you salary. I, I didn't even get... I didn't even get to wait till I was licensed. As soon as I got my LSIT, they made me salary. Okay, and here's what they do. They come to you and they say, this is exactly what happened to me. I passed my LSIT and they came to me and they said, oh, hey, you passed your LSIT, great. We're going to make you salary. And I was like, I didn't even know what that was. I was like, salary? Well, like, I, I, I was 26 or 25. I was like, I was young. I'm like, what's salary mean? They're like, oh, it's great. If there's no work, you get to go home and we pay you. I was like, oh, that sounds pretty cool. And like, yeah, we're going to give you a $3 raise to boot. I'm like, dude, where do I sign up? Okay, guess what? Do you think I ever got sent home in my 12 years at that company? Did I ever get sent home early with nothing to do? No. No, but I sure worked a ton of, a ton of hours. I mean, they just, they worked me like a mule. Okay, so that is a horrible deal. My career advice for you, if you ever go to work at another company, is to never go salary. Okay, it only works in the employer's favor. Last place tried to make you go salary, right? Yeah, so then I took a job at an engineering company that will remain nameless. I took a job for those folks, and I took a $25 an hour pay cut to go back to hourly. Okay, and they worked me like a mule anyways. And when and so then at the end of the year, they said, hey, we've paid you all this overtime. I said, yeah, I know, because I'm hourly. And I'm like, all right, well, we're going to make you go salary. I said, okay, that's great. That comes with the $25 an hour raise, right? They said no. And then that's how RH came into existence. <laughs> okay? So, those are the three things when you cross the line. Good question, Mr. Stetson. You may not get a regular paycheck, you lose your 10% commission and your salary. Okay, so then, that begs the question, why would anybody go below the blue line? To serve your people. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't have an answer to that. Like, I don't know why Brian and Danny did that. 
It might be because they didn't fully understand what it meant. <laughs> okay, no. In all joking aside, here's what being below the blue line gets you. Okay, what being below the blue line gets you is a seat at the decision-making table. Okay, now, we, we, we tend to be pretty open with the decision-making process here anyways, right? You, you guys, most of you guys get a vote on major decisions, but there are times when you will see me go in that room over there and shut the door, and, and Danny and Brian and I are making decisions about who to hire and what clients to take and if we're going to go to four tens or not, right? Okay, so that's what being below the blue line gets you. It gets a seat at the table. Now, for most people, is it worth it? Is it worth crossing that line? Probably not. Probably not. It's probably not, right? I encourage you to stay right above that line. Okay, and here's why we, we purposely built the company that way. Because in most places, the people that become owners do that because they're ego-driven or money-driven or both. Okay, at our company, the only reason people are going to cross that blue line is if they really care about what they do for a living. Right? And they really care about this organization. And you also got to be a bit crazy. And you got to be a little bit crazy. Now, I'm going to tell you guys a story. This is a true story. I went to a principal at the first firm I worked for out of college. And I said, hey, I was about Nick's age, maybe a little bit older. I said, hey, I said, um, you know, you're, you're getting to be in your 50s. You know, the other two owners are, are your age or older. Um, you guys are all overweight and diabetic. Like, I'm a little worried about the future here. I, I said, you know, like, I told him, I said, look, I don't want to be a company owner. I don't need to do that. But, like... If that's the only way to keep this place alive, like I love, I love working here, and this is my family, and I'm willing to do that. What's the plan? And he looked me, in, he looked me in the eye and said, "Nobody has ever asked that question before, and we do not have a plan." Okay. Now the whole, the reason I told you that story is. Why was I interested in being an owner there? Was it because I wanted to make more money? It's because I wanted a corner office. I had a fight with Danny and, and Brian. I wanted to be down in the basement. <laughs> okay? So that's just not what motivates me. Okay? But I, what I was worried about was, is the organization going to survive or not? Right? Okay, so at our age, if somebody crosses that blue line, probably, why are they probably doing it? Do they care about this place? Yeah, they, they're worried about there being a future for the company, right? If you don't care, stay right above the blue line. That's where all the gravy's at. Right? You say all the time that you've got families to feed. Yeah. No, you're right. You make those decisions. Yep. So anyways, that's that's why the blue line's there. Okay? Now, just since we since he brought it up, we'll just I'll just mention this briefly. It's a little bit unrelated. Yeah, it's kinda related. Um the the principals are working on it. We've had some very preliminary discussions, but I suspect at some point in the next twelve to twenty four months, we're gonna put up somewhere between 20 and 40 percent of the company shares but we're going to make those available for employees if they meet certain criteria okay and i think you guys are a few years out from that but the shares are going to be there and it's going to work the same way it's going to be very fair and transparent you meet the criteria you buy you 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 we're going to i say buy the shares you're going to earn the shares you're not going to have to go get a bank loan to buy the shares but there's going to be 40% of the company is going to be on the block in the next 12 to 24 months. Okay? Why am I doing that? Because you guys are old and you want to invest in the future. Because we're overweight and diabetic. Right? No, that's not really why. We're actually in pretty good shape. Me and Brian and Danny are all in pretty good shape. But no, the reason we're doing that is, we, yeah, we're concerned about the future of the company. Right? And, like, is it good to have all of your owners over the age of 40? No? Like, we need a plan, right? We, we, got, we need a plan. And so, like, we're going to... Part of the reason we're going to do that, even though I, I know you guys aren't ready, we're four or five years out probably from somebody being ready to take some of those shares, is like, I want you guys to know we are deathly serious about that. That is not an empty promise. Because guess what? Where I worked, the first place I worked for six years, they strung me along on an empty promise of being a partner. Okay? So, like, it's not going to be an empty promise here. It's going to be in writing. And you guys are going to know what you got to do. Like, whatever. If Nick does what he's got to do and he goes and gets that 40%, then it'll be Nick's. You know, if he splits it with Hunter, he splits it with Hunter. You know, if Austin gets there first, right? Like, it's just, we're going to put it on the block and everybody's going to know what they got to do to go get it. Because Brian wants a nice retirement. He wants to go fishing. Okay? And we want people to be... Now, here, here's what's... We've talked about this a little bit. Here's what's going to happen. At some point in four years, if we put that on the block next year, and in four or five years, 
nobody's close to getting the shares, then what do I have to go do if I want this place to survive? Find other people. I gotta go find somebody that's gonna come in and take those shares, right? But who's gonna get first crack? Boys. You guys, you guys gonna get first crack at those shares, right? Wanna make sure you have plenty of time to do that if you want. Okay, so that's the, everybody understand kind of the career path. All right, let's look at the job description real quick. Um, 